talk after today, so, and I guess most of you don't have a lot of background in reinforcement learning, so this will be a very light talk. And if you're interested in the problem and the setting and also the results, please feel to talk to me offline. Uh, I'm Chi Jing. Um, this, this fall, I will be in IS. I'm also starting as assistant professor in electronic engineering department in Princeton University. And uh, most of my PhD work actually is on like uh, understanding the foundations of uh, machine learning theory, especially like uh, in the perspective of algorithm. Like a lot of my PhD work is on non-convex optimization. And today I would like to share some recent interest in the exploration problem of the reinforcement learning. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. So first, to motivate a reinforcement learning problem, I guess a lot of you have already faced a lot of the sequential decision making problem in practice. Essentially, not uh, it's not like a single decision making problem. You just want to make a single decision. You you actually make a decision, and the environment give you some feedback, and then you adjust and make another decision. And the environment give you another feedback. A, Critical example of this is like Go, and you already know the AI doing this alpha Go is actu actually already beating the world champion. So to solve this sequential decision making problem, one of the framework is called reinforcement learning. And there's a lot of algorithms to do this reinforcement learning. Like um, the two main classes, one is value-based algorithm, including Q learning. The second class is a policy gradient methods. If you don't know value-based algorithm, policy gradient don't don't worry, and uh, you only need to remember Q learning is an algorithm. It's not, it's not like learning framework, it's an algorithm. Okay. So specifically, reinforcement learning framework assume we have an agent, we have an environment. So what we do is for each agent, in, agent need to pick an action and uh, then interact with the environment. And the environment will feedback what it is the next stage you transition to and what is the reward you have. Let's take this chess an example. So the states here is actually the position of each pieces. And the action is uh, like you want to move each piece like to which position. And the reward is like after playing the game, you, you win, you receive the reward one. And you lose, you receive the reward zero. So the reinforcement learning problem, you can view the problem as uh, you want to find a good policy so that you can maximize the cumulative rewards. And in this chess way, it's like uh, what policy is like the way how you play this chess game. So, for the beginning of this talk, I will focus on a tabular setting. Just remember, tabular setting is an easier setting where we assume we have a finite number of states and actions, so that the number of states and actions is very small. Like this chess game, you only have a finite lim limited number of states you can possibly be there. And the actions also, you only have a very limited amount of. So one very important criteria in like seeing which reinforcement learning algorithm is good is in terms of those sample efficiency. Um, why sample efficiency is very important in practice? Because uh, a lot of uh, modern applications, like uh, you want to do Go and you want to train Atari games, usually those state-of-art algorithms already require millions of samples. And this takes uh, a lot of time, like usually weeks to months to train it. And furthermore, a lot of the tasks we're still ongoing, we're trying to solve, like this uh, robotics, we're trying to learn those folding tiles, and also those autonomous drive problems. Collecting those samples could be very expensive. For example, you don't want to crash your car, which will cost you like millions of dollars. And also, it might be very time consuming, because like in this robotic case, like collecting one sample may require five minutes or 10 minutes. So one very basic question people would ask, since Q-learning is a very basic algorithm, has been known for a lot of years. So the first question we'd like to know is, how many samples does Q-learning need to solve this reinforcement learning problems? In order to say more specifically what is a Q-learning, we need to first uh, know a very important concept called value. Essentially, value is expected reward when an agent plays start from a given state and action. For example, this is a state and which is the position, and you can start from any action. The value kind of like reflects your belief and how valuable those current states are, like what is probability you're going to win these games. Okay. And essentially, you know if you have the value, then you can just move each pieces and you see what's the, what's the value you're going to end up being. So you will pick the action which should give you the highest value. So value essentially gives you a policy and how to play the games. And Q-learning is essentially just an algorithm so that you play the games, and then you just perform stochastic, stochastic updates on those values when agents in interact with the environment. Okay. So me personally view reinforcement learning problem as a component of two pieces of questions. One is called planning. The other one is called exploration. Planning is essentially when you know the environment, you know how each piece is going to go, and what is the rewards there. You want to plan optimally. You want to know, like, a, 
in each scenario, what is action I want to choose. But before that, you don't even know the environment. So the first problem is about exploration. Essentially, exploration is instead of just knowing the environment, you want to say, how should I visit all the states? For example, in this, uh, in this uh, early age of like colonization, maybe your rewards is kind of like uh, which island I should colonize and which give me, give me the highest rewards. Um, but before that, you first need to have, find a way to visit all the islands. And those is kind of like called exploration. A very basic exploration algorithm is called epsilon greedy. Essentially, you just, uh, for the most of the time, you just to pick the greedy action, the, those actions which you currently believe is the best. And with some small probability epsilon, you just take some random actions. So those random actions, although maybe they end up something random, but they give you at least some chance to visit something unknown and they might be good. Okay. So this gives us a very basic algorithm called a curing epsilon greedy with epsilon greedy exploration. And this algorithm is still the textbook algorithm you would learn like in the reinforcement learning class. But the question is, uh, is this sample efficient? Classically, we know Q learning with epsilon greedy will find optimal policy if the sample goes to infinity. That means if I collect infinite amount, amount of samples. But unfortunately, there are definitely some examples which saying it's actually not sample efficient. In the worst case, it requires something exponential in the horizon of the games. For example, if your game has like a uh, hundred steps or like uh, it's episodic games. And then the number of samples to, in order to find optimal policy may be 2 to the 100 in the worst case. So this raises up, up a question, is a Q learning this, is this basic algorithm terrible, or is this just exploration algorithm is like a little bit too naive? So in order to answer this question, we look at another field. It's called a bandit field. Bandit, bandit field, the entire field is talking about how to trade off this exploitation and exploration. The bandit is essentially you have a lot of bandit machine, and it's a very basic question. And we assume each machine has an arm. And when you pull the arm, you receive a reward, which is stochastic reward has a different mean. And you just want to repeatedly pull different arms. And you eventually want to identify which arm is the best, and you just want to pull it. It's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation, because you don't want to just randomly explore a lot of different arms, and you kind of like lose a lot of game in the meantime. And there is a more sophisticated algorithm to do exploration instead of epsilon greedy. It's called upper confidence bound. So upper confidence bound, instead of just uh, calculating what is the mean of each, uh, suppose in a very simple case, we only have two arms. OK. And we just want to understand like, which arm is the best. And, and I, don't, I don't lose a lot of money by putting a suboptimal arm a lot of times. Instead of just uh, maintaining a mean estimate of each arm so that I can do epsilon greedy and just do some random afterwards, uh, I actually maintain both mean and the standard deviation. Like I maintain some confidence of each arm. So for example, in this case, I pull first arm four times, where the cross is kind of like you know, the, 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 the value I pull it. And the mu one is like uh, my mean. A mu one is a true mean. So then, in this case, empirical mean is here, and I have a confidence, roughly. I'm saying, like, uh, at most, my, my true mean cannot be greater than this UCB1, the blue curve. Where on the other hand, I only pull two times the se second arm. So although the mean is uh, roughly the same, but uh, my confidence is much lower. So I'm saying maybe this arm is much better, and my upper confidence is something like in the green curve. And the algorithm to do upper confidence band is, is just uh, is essentially just putting the largest plausible arm, large, uh, just picking the action with the largest UCB. Okay. You see this algorithm, instead of just using the mean information, it's also used the variance information. It actually turns out it provides you a much more efficient way to do exploration. So this is, and this is essentially the results we can prove. This is a joint work with Joan Alenzu, Sebastian Bubeck, and Michael Jordan. And the first two others are uh, contributed equally. So in this work, we actually show Q-learning just with upper confidence bounds. We can find epsilon optimal policy in this number of episodes. Episodes means like how many times you play the games. This h to the q, s a over epsilon square. Epsilon is like the opt um, how optimal it is. And uh, H is the length of the, each episode, the length of the game. And S is number of states, A is number of action. I guess uh, most importantly, we show, although Q learning with epsilon greedy is going to suffer exponential in terms of H, but now we can, only, we can do everything actually in polynomial number of H. So we no longer have anything 
exponential, and this is efficient. So this is a first. This turns out actually to be the first model-free guarantees with uh, this polynomial guarantees about sample efficiency. And secondly, we can also look at the lower bound. This lower bound is not only about Q learning; it's like any algorithm, information theoretically, cannot find the epsilon optimal policy in the worst case if I use less than h square as a over epsilon square episodes. What that means is you compare this lower bound with our upper bound. You see the only difference is 1h. Okay. So that means other than this uh, w one factor of length of episode, the, the very simple algorithm Q-learning, as long as you do the exploration correctly, you can already sam achieve almost optimal sample efficiency. This is the second takeaway. And we can definitely just implement this uh, simple algorithm um, in some challenging case, which is a combinatorial lock. And we can compare performance of the two algorithms. One is a Q learning with upper confidence bound. The other one is a standard one, textbook algorithm, Q learning with epsilon greedy. And we actually work on a very sim a small uh, MDP, Markov decision process, where we only have two states and five actions. The length of game is only six. And uh, this is like a measure in terms of 10,000 of episodes. We can see if we run a classical algorithm, we are not doing anything in the, in the beginning of the episodes, just because we try some random actions. And this random action has only a very small chance ends up finding something useful. And eventually, it finds out something useful, but it's already after a lot of episodes. While our algorithm, it, very, it, it find optimal policy very fastly and then accumulate these rewards linearly. So uh, this is like uh, the main story. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about technical challenging. Although I phrased this problem as uh, I just combined uh, this classical algorithm in a binary literature, it's actually you need to do a lot of adaptation to make this uh, uh, idea of up confidence bound work in this time sequential scenario. And uh, if you just naively adapt those kind of up confidence bound, it will still give you something exponential in terms of h. And the other thing I want to mention is uh, this Q-learning is actually a model-free algorithm. So it does not explicitly build a model of the environment. It just uh, builds a model of values. Okay. And to, in order to overcome those technical challenges, we need to introduce a new mechanism, which we call favoring later updates. And it's getting very technical. If you're interested, please uh, see the paper, or feel free to talk to me in offline. And finally, I just want to say a little bit about uh, the continual work about uh, beyond tabular setting. So, so far, what we talk about is all about tabular setting, which means uh, we only have a small number of states and actions. Well, in practice, uh, we definitely cannot just say the number of states is very small. For example, I'm not only interested in solving the chess, I'm actually interested in solving the Atari games, where each state is uh, represented by the position of each pixels and uh, somewhere else. And so in this case, uh, the states is definitely order of millions or even more. And if you just say classical way, so-called tabular setting is I say I have a value for each states. OK, that means I represent this value in terms of a table where each entry of table corresponding to the value for each states. But now, if I just maintain this table is kind of super large, I can no longer do it computational feasibly. So what people usually do in practice is uh, I'm saying there is some similarity between different states so that I can approximate my value by some parametric function instead of representing it by like the whole table. However, this function approximation actually introduced a lot of new challenges in this setting. And uh, unlike the tabular setting, they're essentially like almost uh, no results before, and there are few results very recently. So one of the results we have been done recently is, uh, is in the very simple setting of a linear function approximation. So we just move one step further, and we're seeing if the value function can be present and like uh, approximated by the linear function. So in the theorem, in a joint work with uh, uh, Yang and Wang and uh, Jordan, and we actually show and if the transition dynamics and rewards, both of them, both of the model of MDP is actually linear in features, then we can use another value-based algorithm, which is very similar to Q-learning. And again, we just adapted the upper confidence bound techniques. And we can find epsilon optimal policy, again, no longer in exponential in terms of h, just polynomial in dimensionality, polynomial in h, and 1 over epsilon square. Here, instead of having number of states and action, actually replace everything by dimension of features. So that although even if the number of states is super large, they may be like uh, exponential in dimensionality, but um, I'm still getting everything in polynomial. Okay. 
So this basically concludes my talk. And in terms of the future work, I guess that there are a lot of continual work you can do about this exploration in terms of function approximation. One basic question is here, we actually assume the model transition dynamics and rewards are both linear. If you can relax those assumptions to be like something misspecified and model is no longer that linear, or some, like for example, if the function class is linear, optimal value function is linear, but, but not the entire model is linear. And the second thing is like beyond linear function class, you can do a lot of different things, like uh, for example, neural networks and how to do exploration efficiently. This is kind of like widely open. I guess this this is all. Thanks.